we'll get going here. It is my um, great pleasure to introduce <coughs> Jillian Blomberg. Blomberg, sorry. Um, Jillian's a Huxley alumna who graduated here in 1995 with a Bachelor of Science degree in toxicology, uh, like many of you. Um, and then went on to do a, Kente a PhD at the University of Kentucky, mm -hmm. again, in, in toxic toxicology and aquatic toxicology um, specifically. Uh, she works now for NOAA, uh, for the Northwest M Marine Fisheries. What is the? I am actually a contractor for Ocean Associates Incorporated, for working for the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, okay. which is part of NOAA Fisheries. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's complicated. It is complicated. <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, it is uh, it's always great to have to welcome back an alum and someone that has done such wonderful work and has distinguished herself and by reflection all of us. So thank you very much. Thank for you. Appreciate it. Um, for those of you who may have seen me here, what, four, three, four years ago, this is an update to the talk I gave then. For those of you who I was lucky enough to come uh, a few uh, back in October and speak to the math department, this is completely different. So at least it'll be a little bit more interesting, hopefully. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to talk to you today is on some of the work that our group and others have done on uh, the effects of urban runoff, stormwater runoff on coho salmon. And this is not just my work. I'm just one of many that have been involved in this process, primarily David Baldwin, Jennifer McIntyre, Steve Dam, Jay Davis, and Nat Schultz. Um, they're with, with NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service and also Washington State University, if you all up campus. Um, and so there's lots of collaborations, and more of those are listed here. Um, th this is work that's been ongoing since 2002 with our uh, group, and so there have been lots and lots of people involved, lots of support, um, EPA, NOAA Coastal Storms, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Washington State University Department of Ecology, City of Seattle, Suquamish Tribe, uh, and the Russell Family and Bullet Foundations. And so there's, this has been, like I said, a long, this could just be a, a snapshot of some of the adult coho work that we've done um, and the progress we've made in the last eight, seven or eight years primarily. Um, also, individuals that have been extremely helpful um, none of this work would have, would have been possible without the assistance of the Suquamish Tribe, uh, Grover's Creek Hatchery staff and volunteers, primarily Mike Huff, Jay, Bill, Ben, and the Kitsap Pogi Club, which are a group of volunteers who like to fish and want to make sure there are fish around, and so they come out and help the hatchery make sure there are fish around, and they're great. Also, Fish and Wildlife, more staff from Fish and Wildlife and also other parts of NOAA. Um, like I said, big group efforts um, for all this work. So, basically, you know, what we, what we want to look at are what are the environmental impacts of <coughs> urban runoff. We know that we've changed systems from a forested area where the water precipitation comes down, flows into the groundwater, flows into the streams, and into the, bay, into the sound. That's what's supposed to happen. We tend to change that. We put rooftops and roadways and lawns in, and we prevent infiltration. So the water comes off, we put it in a drain, and we stick it directly into a run, uh, waterway, usually an urban creek. And so we want to say what effects could there be go uh, occurring because of this? How can we minimize uh, those effects? And if we're trying to minimize them, are, is what we're doing working? So that's kind of what our uh, um, group looks at is trying to look at the biology, let, let the biology, let the ecosystem tell us what's going on in the system. Uh, we know that some practices reduce chemical X by 70%. Well, that's great, but if the system is still, if the water is still toxic, we want to the let the biology tell us that. Because when we have situations that are like this that happen frequently, when you have a significant uh, rain event, and this happens to be in the Montlake Cut in Seattle, uh, combined sewer overflow, you've got what you can see that's happening and also what we can't see. And when we may not see that plume, what is also present could be a lot of these uh, heavy metals, copper, mercury, lead, as well as your insecticides, um, your pharmaceuticals, your statins, caffeine, and anything that we put in our bodies, it's going out, it's going to end up somewhere, particularly if we don't have any way of uh, treating. So our concern being then, what's, it, what's going on then with the biota? And we've used coho salmon as a sentinel species for this, primarily because they're widely distributed. Uh, they happen to coincide with our urban areas and lowland streams. They spend over a year in fresh water uh, before migrating out to the ocean. Um, they also require a very diverse food web, um, and so the, any effects on that can be translated up to the juveniles as they're rearing. 
and they are also sensitive to water quality and quantity. And in Puget Sound, they're listed as a species of concern. So they're not endangered yet, but they're having problems. And so we really want to hopefully prevent them being listed as a threatened or endangered. So, so briefly, the coho salmon life cycle, most of you are probably familiar with. Um, adults come in, spawn and die in fresh water. Um, eggs incubate for around here, about 60 to 70 days. Um, Alvins come in first year, um, sp spend a year rearing in the freshwater system, then out migrate, spend about a year in the op op open ocean, and then return. But what we're really looking at is when they're highly at risk due to the stormwater impacts during this freshwater phase, these three fresh freshwater phases, and which are prettier pictures here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are the effects on the adult stage and some preliminary information on what we've seen with some uh, em uh, embryo developmental stage uh, exposures. So, adult stage. Um, in the late 90s, there was a big push to help uh, restore our urban creeks. A lot of money was put in for riparian zone uh, refor or re vegetation, um, cleaning up, putting in spawning habitat, that sort of thing. And the Wild Fish Conservancy was doing post-restoration monitoring by walking the creeks and looking for fish. And well, what do you expect when you walk through a salmon uh, stream during spawning season? You expect dead carcasses. But they were seeing fish that acted like this. That wasn't quite normal. <coughs> so, and there's this, there's not a lot of water here, but I'll show you some other shots. But this typical splayed, of, splayed fins, gaping, um, they were seeing this repeatedly with lots of different fish. And then they were opening up the carcasses and seeing something they weren't expecting, which was none of the females, or very few of the females had spawned. And so you're seeing this pre-spawn mortality that wasn't linked to lack of water, temperature, effects, pathogens, predation, anything like that. These were good-looking fish. Um, they just hadn't spawned. They, for some reason, they were dying before they were spawning. And they were showing the symptomology that I just showed you, and I'll show you some more of that in a minute. And we were seeing it multiple across years, across locations in the urban area. And sometimes the rates in the females were documenting 40 to 90 percent. And here's some more deeper water pictures of uh, the symptomology. And these fish pretty much are oblivious to anybody around them. Uh, I've picked up these fish. If you like, accidentally want to take a picture and you've got too much sediment picked up, walk over to them. You can gently pick them up and move them. They don't notice. They are not at all um, taking the input from the outside that it's, they can uh, comprehend. The other thing we were noticing, we were doing daily surveys and looking at carcasses. And this graph shows on top the blue bars showing um, daily rainfall events in inches. Then the next one is the flow in Longfellow Creek in West Seattle. And you can see that normally it's a very, very low flow creek, even in the fall during rain events. And then it spikes up. It's very flashy. Um, and then the, the red bars are the uh, number of dead uh, pre-spawn female carcasses we were finding. And then the green ones are the, the spawned out carcasses. And you can see during these storm events, we were seeing lots of dead carcasses. And it wasn't until really there wasn't any rain occurring that we were fi finally starting to see some females that had spawned. So there was intensive forensic investigations that were ongoing, um, primarily water, uh, water quality, such as temperature, oxygen, uh, pH, all that stuff, all normal. They were, but these fish were consistently dying um, in the falls. It was widespread across urban watersheds, um, pretty high rates of mortality in these areas, and it seemed to be related to something toxic in the system. It wasn't, you know, there were no pathogens. We did um, lots and lots of F studies. And if you want to look more in depth than that, that's uh, the 2011 Schultz et al. paper uh, outlines everything that was done looking for what could be causing that. But what it really pointed to was that something during, when that, System got flashy, all that stormwater came in. There was something in that mix that was causing these fish to display these symptoms and, and die. <coughs> and so then we started looking, okay, what's gonna, what could that be linked to? So we put it on a map. And oh, kind of went, okay, Piper's Creek, Thornton Creek, Longfellow, pretty high rates. Fortson Creek out by Darrington, not so much. Hmm, what looks to be different? And then it's kind of the, the level of urbanization. So we did some GIS work and that here just shows those maps, those uh, watersheds again. 
And this is um, those same areas overlaid on an urban density map. Um, and that's showing the more urbanized the area, it seemed to be the more uh, higher levels of pre-spawn we were seeing. But we didn't have a lot of data points. Did an initial uh, analysis, which was uh, with just those six data points, and we did see that those uh, rates seemed to correlate really strongly with uh, imperviousness and road density, pr primarily ar arterial roads. <coughs> and, but it looked like this could be a lar uh, you know, big swath of the, the Puget Sound region that could be affected by this phenomenon, even where there may not be fish anymore or if we're trying to reintroduce them, could be a problem. And that's the uh, Faisadol paper, also in 2011. And PLS one, so it's available. Um, but with that, you know, that's really sparse. Not a lot of, of information there. A lot, a lot of data points. So let's see what else is out there. So we reached out to um, tribes, other municipalities, um, local uh, cities, uh, Wild Fish Conservancy, and got a lot more data points. Uh, all of them are, po are listed here. There are now 51 data points to put into a new Bayesian analysis for looking at different land use parameters. And um, we're also looking across the urbanized gradient. So it's not just urban versus rural, it's some of these midpoint areas as well. And the, uh, the green dots are the data points showing less than 10% free spawn mortality in the adult coho. The, the, the yellow triangles are the um, 10 to 50%, and the plus signs are greater than 50% free spawn. So you can see there was a, a variety of uh, intermediate levels that were also incorporated in this assessment. And um, we were also able to incorporate some climate effects in their precipitation in the summer and the fall, because that seems to be related. And so we came up with, this is the preliminary uh, map for the Puget Sound region. And we did see that it was co positively correlated with urbanization, but this model is having a, a harder time uh, teasing out exactly which parameters are most um, important because of the collinearities that are involved. We're still working on it. But when we get this one finished up, we'll also have a measurement of uncertainty around each of these assessments for each watershed. So we'll be able to say, you know, to a municipality, this is your watershed. This is a risk that we forecast here and the uncertainty around that prediction. Uh, and the next steps we're going hoping to take, or will be taking, will be to then look at um, uh, the growth management areas and say, okay, if we urbanize in the way we've been urbanizing our systems um, it, to the extent that we've planned what could happen to the coho that we have that are currently viable populations versus and then also others that are potentially at risk um, and then also incorporating other uh, climate change issues with the precipitation portions of the model. So that kind of tells us okay we're you know they're still relying on the fact that yes it's stormwater that's causing this what we hadn't proven that yet. Um, I'll briefly, toward the end, show you some data on, we, we did try, we thought, okay, it's roads, therefore we're going to throw PAHs, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which come from oils and metals at them, which kind of come off, which are typical of what we think of coming off cars. Um, that failed miserably. Uh, we took a, a shot and struck out. So, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll see, looking at what we've done here, the logistics of handling and doing experiments on adult coho uh, spawners can be a logistic challenge, and so doing lots of uh, narrowing down of which contaminants could be possible it would take more resources than are currently available um, and in a timely manner. So our initial, uh, or not, this, our, the second portion that we did was, we'll just take some runoff, expose them to that, and say, okay, did it work? Um, so that's what I'm going to show you here first. And we're then looking, at, you know, in a controlled system, did we get the, this, um, symptomology that we were expecting. So we teamed up with the Grover's Creek Hatchery, which is located in the little yellow box here on the Kitsap Peninsula. The fish come up uh, out of, through Miller Bay and in, enter freshwater. It's less than a kilometer from the seawater into the, where their uh, hatchery program and their pond is located, where they come up a fish ladder and are trapped. They're, the coho are primarily following chum, which is what the hatchery produces. And so that's the picture here, so those, those great little or big uh, chum that are uh, going to be used for their hatchery program. Since they don't use the coho, they made them available to us as well as the space um, to run our experiments. Um, and so then we just needed a source of water that we could transport over there. 
but one of the concerns being, well, you can't just pick up water out of, a, out of a stream and take it to another location because of the risk of transporting pathogens, et cetera. So we needed water that had never touched any freshwater body. So we thought, oh, we're real kind of coincidentally quite lucky because, well, this is an elevated highway that gets about 60,000 vehicle trips per day. And right as its downspout is into our parking lot. <laughs> so we just stuck a collection apparatus underneath the downspout, which would normally just, the water would normally land on the ground and run into Lake Washington. So we weren't interfering with what was normally happening other than capturing it. Um, the first year, we used glass carboys to collect the water, wrapped in the black plastic so the pH of the northern organics wouldn't be broken down by the light as quickly. And then since then, we have ac acquired several stainless steel tanks that we can just stick under there and collect a whole lot more water a lot faster. <laughs> um, these thi anyone who's thinking about using a system like this, remember airlocks. They happen and they're very inconvenient. Um, so we collected the water directly off the elevated highway. It never touched another stream system waterway, we would truck it and ferry it over to the hatchery. And when we were collecting, we did a variety of collections um, that first year. The initial one was after a very long dry spell had occurred. And that was here, the blue, blue indicates the collection periods, the um, red bars are the daily rainfall and the dotted red uh, line is the cumulative rain rainfall for the season. And so we collected not only at the beginning of, of the, the fall rains, but during an and you'll note this third collection was started to collection the day after over an inch of rain had fallen. So if there was going to be a huge amount of wash off, it would have happened in that first inch of rain and uh, less so potentially later. So if we were going to see a lower toxicity, we thought that might be when it would occur. Um, this is what water looks like coming out of the downspout. <laughs> uh, yes, yum. So what we did with fish, they come into the pond, we put them in these PVC tubes. These are, uh, to scale, is uh, they're a six inch and eight inch diameter PVC. Um, these are used primarily for hauling spawning fish um, for hatchery programs. And that's where we got the idea from. And uh, so we put them in 440 li four fish and 440 liters of water, uh, providing flow through these uh, tubes attached to a pump in the, in the tank with them. They're getting about four liters a minute of flow over their, their head and nose so that they're, as long as they're in flow, they're pretty content. Um, we've maintained fish in here in the system for 48 hours without a problem. So they, once they settle down, throw a tarp over it, get it dark, and they just kind of hang out. So they're a lot less stressed than if we were trying to put them in open tanks, the volume of water we would need would be huge because we would try to prevent them from jumping out and that sort of thing. So this seemed to be a more easier way to keep, keep them from hurting themselves or each other. So this is setting up fish in tube, tube and water, hose in for each one. Um, you'll notice early on, some of those pictures have carabiners on right here. We did discover it on our first year that carabiners will leach metals, particularly zinc and copper over 24 hours. So if you're worried about or working on that sort of thing, replace them with plastic. Um, uh, shower hooks look, work really well. Um, so that's why we, we, we were transporting them with carabiners and we would replace them with the hooks as we put them in the, in the exposure water. And so then set them up and check them every few hours. We have oxygen, or excuse me, air. Well, this year, we, that particular year, we had both air stones and oxygen tanks pumping in to make sure we maintain oxygen levels uh, at the appropriate level. Um, monitored that every 15 to 20 minutes and checked the fish about every 30 minutes to see what they were going to be doing. And either we'd open up a, the, tu the front of the tube to see what the fish was doing. If the fish tried to come out the tube at you, it was feeling pretty good, we just put it back in. If the fish didn't come out the tube at you, then we'd stick it in the uh, uh, observation tank with clean well water. And this is what we would look for. So our control fish, you'd pull them out after four hours. They're swimming around, look and see what's going on. It's a pretty small tank, so they're gonna check out the sides. They're gonna look for a dark space. They're gonna respond to any movement over the top of them and look to, for a shadow to hide in. And fish that were stormwater exposed were not uh, paying attention to anybody. Uh, we're not able to keep oriented properly in the water. Um, get, you can see the, the splaying of fins. Um, yeah, right before this picture was started, this video was started, the fish was swimming upside down in circles around the tank. It was quite sad. So what happened for that first year was control fish. We had 100% um, 
survival and all normal behaviors. And for the, oh, it has sound. It shouldn't have sound. That's not good. Okay, we'll ignore that, please. <laughs> um, but all of our um, ex stormwater exposed fish within four hours were showing symptomology similar to what we had seen in the urban creeks. Um, these fish we then took down um, and sampled while they were still alive because we wanted to take tissue samples for RNA analysis and you can't do that on a dead fish. So that was why this, that particular year we stopped all of our exposures at four hours while the fi or, or when the fish were really definitely so showing symptomology and we didn't want them to die before our next check. So that's why this two and a half hour fish didn't go to three hours. So um, just for a real quick, don't worry, this is mostly just to show that water quality parameters um, for con your conventionals were fine. They varied across different storm events, but they were not outside the biological uh, needs of the, the salmon, so they were all fine in these systems. Um, and then not too far off from our controls, so. But they did vary from storm to storm. So we thought, okay, yes, something in that mixture of stuff coming off the road surfaces was c showing similar symptomology to what we were seeing in the field. We don't know exactly what it is yet. We're still doing a lot of chemistry on the uh, analysis on the, on the water, but the next question was, well, even though we don't know what it is, can we stop it? Can we do something about it? And so with our work with the Washington State University uh, Extension Campus in Puyallup, their stormwater uh, center, um, like I said, was saying we do a lot of uh, using the biology to tell us whether or not the mitigation practices are working. So one of the mitigation practices involves biofiltration uh, through various uh, bioretention systems. So the one we chose to, to uh, test in this system was just the uh, 2012 manual media mixture of 60% sand and 40% water. I mean, excuse me, more water, compost, sorry. Uh, and so we have a little mulch on top, 24 inches of sand and, and compost mix, and then 12 inches of gravel, and the water, you sprinkle the water on top at three mils per minute and collect it out the bottom and see what happens. And that's literally, that's all we did to it. Um, we've, we've made them up new each, each season and then let it go through and, and repeatedly used it throughout the, the season. So this is what they look like um, in person and out at the hatchery. And so this was when we were doing our initial tests of just conditioning them with well water just to get, make sure that they're were working properly and flow was going well. Um, you wash them out at about what is it, seven pore volumes just to get anything that's really gonna migrate out quickly out of the system. But this is what well water looks like after it comes out of, of the uh, Looks like a little, a little bit of tea there, but, but it's, well, it's what we had. So, okay, we thought, okay, once we put that really black, nasty stuff through it, what was going to happen? So we collected stormwater runoff. I'm going to show you data from two seasons, 2013-2014. Uh, um, didn't get a lot of uh, collections in in 2013 due to shutdowns and things. So um, just other logistics that were outside of our experimental control. Um, and then it snowed over here, so <laughs> actually it was frozen. Anyway, so this is when we were able to get some samples in 2013, and then we repeated again this fall and got three more sets of samples, uh, three storm events, and so we take the, st um, the big stainless steel tank, uh, 230 gallons of water, haul it over. Um, we get the fish out. This is what the pond sy system looks like as the, the hatchery staff are seining the pond, and then we're sorting fish, and while I was doing that, our rest of our crew was up filtering the water. This is what the water looks like when it came out of, this was what the r runoff looked like when it came out of the, uh, the system. It didn't look a whole lot different than the well water did. It was kind of surprising. So now we knew, we, we assa assumed the, no the uh, control fish would still be normal. Um, the untreated runoff would probably still consistently be symptomatic, and it was, but what was gonna happen with the treated fish? So this is um, well water after four hours. That the filtration added some time to the, our day, which meant the four hour time check was in the dark, which meant my headlights in my car were lighting this thing up. <laughs> so happy fish there, unfiltered fish down here at the bottom, really not happy. But two of them were alive at four hours, which was good. And the filtered fish, looking for dark, trying to hide, moving, seemed fine. And that was consistent. Um, all fish alive at 24 hours. Um, and didn't seem to have any other effects. Um, 
particularly not since the, the primary one we were looking for was death, and they were not dead. So that was a good thing. We don't know of any sublethal effects that might have been going on, but, um, but at least they were still swimming upright and normally. And so this is just a quick summary of the, uh, those five tests. And like I said, as I said, 100% of the runoff of the untreated runoff fish were symptomatic or dead at the end of the exposure. Uh, particularly when we took the exposure 24 hours, they were, everybody was dead, usually all dead by four hours. And then uh, treated fish were all fine at 24 hours and just the same looking as controls. So uh, don't know if they would successfully spawn. That's uh, something that is, is a question, but at least they were swimming. Um, so folks are gonna be curious about the chemistry. This is the only chemistry slide I'm gonna show. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to show for the metals and pHs that we typically look at, um, the metals are they're listed here on the left, cadmium, copper, lead, nickel, and zinc. These are just the dissolved concentrations that were shown. Um, the runoff, untreated runoff is in the red uh, box. The filtered, the two filtered, uh, we don't have, <laughs> other note, we haven't gotten all the data back from 2014 uh, samples. So those are just the two 2013 filtered samples, um, and then the 2012 and 13 runoff. Um, but the, air, the lines connect the appropriate unfiltered water with the filtered result um, to see how the, each compound changed. And then the pH is polyaromatic hydrocarbons grouped by ring number for the parent and alkylated compounds, two to six rings. Um, so you can see everything went down some considerably. These are all in log scales. Um, lead didn't drop too much, but other, and zinc sometimes didn't hardly drop at all, and other times dropped a great deal. Um, still not sure if there was a lot of input from the compost. We're still testing that to see if what it was actually adding back. And some studies have shown that um, it can provide, a, 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 it actually can release a great deal of nickel and copper, but didn't in these particular, or at least not compared to what the what was going into the system. Um, but one of the things we can show is that. It, it did decrease a lot of these. Um, and then what I did briefly mention is we did try some uh, tests with trying to make up our own artificial stormwater cocktail based on um, urban, uh, excuse me, urban creek monitoring data that we've had been taken during storm events uh, when we were seeing pre-spawn mortality fish in the, in the urban creeks. And so we thought, okay, we'll take these fat actors that we assume are going to be involved and throw them in there at really high concentrations and see what happens. And what the, I should have mentioned the first, um, anything with a white or open symbol is a live fish, and anything with, or all live fish, and anything with the black is all dead fish. So as you can see, in the uh, artificial stormwater, everybody was fine. And we, some of these, we extended to 48 hours of exposure, and they were still all happy. <laughs> so... And, you know, so the pH is, the lower ring pH is, um, we used crude oil as the base for it. And so that's got a lot of the two, three, and four ring compounds. But it has less proportion of the five and six rings. So those were not in our cocktail at as high concentrations as the runoff have. Um, but for our metals, we were at or above all the metals that we were testing here. Um, so these compounds may be involved and necessary for the um, creating the pre-spawn mortality syndrome, but they were not sufficient to cause it in the mixtures we, we were showing. So we had the pHs and all five metals in one mixture, and that still didn't um, to do that, didn't create that effect. So. so up to this point, we can say with the adult exposures that highway runoff did result in similar sim symptomology that was very similar to that observed in the field. It, it apparently contains the contaminants that are both necessary and sufficient to ca cause pre-spawn mortality symptomology. And the bioretention filtration did reduce the acute mortality from the highway runoff, and so that did, was eliminated. So that is a potential uh, way to, you know, prevent the problem without finding out exactly what the problem is, with, uh, what the cause of the problem is. So the next question that we had was, okay, so there are some fish that still are successfully spawning, what about those guys that are still in these creeks and exposed to this stuff? So in 2007, I think this was, this initial uh, field study, we actually looked at filtered stream water and unfiltered stream water using a, a different filtration system of uh, carbon filtration. Um, and exp uh, let 
Coho developed to 50 days. Um, we had some flooding issues that it stopped the experiment at that point, so we had to end there. But um, we did see that in the filtered water, we, um, fish look, the embryos look pretty normal. Only about 10% were abnormal or, or didn't survive. But in the unfiltered water, about 75% of them were having abnormalities, and some of these included um, hemorrhaging. This, this one, there, these two are the same age, have been exposed to the same temperatures, but this one is considerably smaller. Um, there are potentially some jaw def deformities here. Um, in addition, looking at the circulatory development um, in the filtered water, it was very symmetrical, um, good, um, good looking veins and, and stuff. And <laughs> same age fish down below in the unfiltered water, uh, you're seeing um, blood clots. I believe this is a vein going in a very odd direction. So it just, yeah, not, not looking very normal. Um, so that was done previously. So we wanted to say, okay, with the new system, filtration system we have, can we replicate this experiment and see what happens? So we did episodic exposures from gastrulation through uh, right before hatch. And uh, unfortunately, this became a pilot study because we had a few things we needed to learn. Um, but I can show you what we did, um, basically. Um, this graph shows degree days in the blue line, and that's days of development. Um, we were exceptionally lucky. Be, the hatchery has very consistently temp uh, temperatured water. Um, even though this looks like an absolute straight line, it's not quite. But this was um, taking temperature measurements every 15 minutes for 55 days of development and averaging the degree days. And it, yeah, it came out very consistent across all the treatments. Uh, we had five stacks of fish, um, of embryos developing, and everybody was within one degree day um, by the end of 55 days. So that was, we were pleased that that worked, pro worked well. Um, the uh, yellow dots are times we were doing sampling imaging. Um, Primarily using our, uh, uh, looking microscopically at eye development, eye size, length, um, and looking for any abnormalities such as hemorrhaging, et cetera. And then um, the pink color, or fuchsia colored bars indicate our um, exposure periods. We only had seven 24 hour exposures during the 55 days of, of development. So that's, you know, pretty low. Uh, considering how long that fish is developing, but we did, that was what was available based on when it rained and when we had staff, because unfortunately this big gap is Thanksgiving and this big gap is Christmas. <laughs> so, th and, and these samples took six to eight people per day, so it, it's very intense, um, labor intensive. Um, but these, each picture represents one of our sampling points. So you can see how, how we were developing, um, but our exposures, we had one exposure uh, during the cleavage period and then only a couple in gastrulation and then uh, finally in organogenesis. One of the things we learned, or I learned, is that chorion is pretty darn tough. Um, we really didn't see any major differences. We were looking at specifically at eye size, which can be a, a really big factor, um, actually really linked to cardiac development as well. And, and um, if, if the heart isn't developing properly, it actually can be shown up as a difference in eye size, a, a, a smaller eye size. And we didn't see that, um, at least up until here, for sure. Um, and then we had some issues that happened with the system through here, and so we lost a lot of data at the end. So we have pretty pictures, and we'll try again next year. Um, but one thing was there didn't seem to be a big difference between any of the treatments uh, up until about the 22nd, 21st of December, and then this last uh, exposure seemed to have made a big difference. Either that or something else went horribly wrong in the system we didn't know about. Because we were, de we were definitely seeing differences after that point, which we hadn't seen anything up to that point. So it was almost as if all the development stopped in some of the treatments at that point. Um, but without having our controls all died, um, <laughs> a few other things went wrong, so we're not sure if that's real. Um, so we're hoping to repeat it this fall with our lessons learned and um, do a better job of it. And uh, hopefully a little few more exposures, but we're also going to look more intently on what's getting through the chorion. And if, um, because at this point, the hatchery stops some of their treatments for fungus, et cetera, because they're concerned about 
killing the fish because of what they're putting in the water, which they're not concerned about that in earlier stages because things don't get into chorion. So the chorion may be thinning here, and that's when our uh, whatever's in the stormwater can also get, get inside and cause some trouble. So, but up to this point, you know, these are happily developing little coho. Um, it was kind of cool to see it in um, probably around here, which is ha not even halfway through development, you're starting to see blood vessels and uh, and you can see individual blood cells going through. It's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I greatly admired our, our staff who were experts at, you, at the microscopy and analysis. And they usually do this stuff on zebrafish embryos, which are little tiny things, which make these look giant. And um, yeah, I was duly impressed with what their skill sets are. <laughs> um, but more to come. Hopefully we'll uh, learn something about that and be able to follow up. Um, overall next steps for the project include uh, finishing up our anal analysis of the water chemistry for 2014. We're not only doing the standard suite of compounds we've been doing, but also looking at uh, new compounds or a different suite that includes things like um, uh, fuel additives, uh, oil stabilizers, tire particle leachate, um, that sort of stuff. Looking at other things that could come off cars that may not be in the standard suite of things we normally test for. I briefly mentioned we had taken down that first set of, of adult exposures for RNA analysis, and so we're in the process of getting those analyzed um, at, down at Stanford. Um, we should have that data hopefully in the next few months to find out. Uh, we're hoping that, that what that will show us is which physiological pathways are being impaired or are trying to respond to this insult. And we can compare that with the fish that have been exposed to the stormwater versus and compare that with the fish that were in, in the field that we were seeing sy that were symptomatic. And if those are the same pathways, then we can try to then backtrack which compounds could be causing that. Uh, as I mentioned, we're also going to uh, be repeating the embryo study this fall. And the other thing we want to look at is we've been focused on co uh, coho here because they're a species of concern and, and they're widespread. But a lot of folks, th there are anecdotal evidence that and reports by some of the other folks that are doing stream surveys of maybe this is happening in, in Chinook and um, chum salmon. And so we're hoping at least to do chum salmon because they do come into the hatchery simultaneously with the coho so we can do side-by-side -side exposures um, and compare the sensitivity with those two species. Um, but in previous work that we've done, our, our field work um, in like Piper's Creek where the coho and chum are simultaneously cohabitating, we're seeing happily spawning chum next to dying, 20 yards from co dying coho. So it might be a, just a concentration issue. Um, but so that's one of the things we want to look at next um, with the adult studies. So, and then comes the other question I get uh, uh, at times. Aside from the research, um, you know, what can we all do to, to address these concerns? And the stormwater threats are, and the solutions are about connections, about getting either the, the water into the ground, letting the ground do its job, or if that's not appropriate for that location, some other form of, of treatment. Also, source control, how we're, you know, looking at <coughs> what we're putting out there. Um, and, it, you know, everybody, it's everybody's issue. It's not like it's a, this isn't a, a point source of industry X. This is everybody's involved. Um, so our day-to-day -day activities, maintain our vehicles, make sure we're not leaking stuff all over, and following label instructions for chemicals that we're, we are using. Um, they're there for a reason. <laughs> Um, green stormwater infrastructure, and we're, we're, we've tested this one methodology. We're also going to be looking at some other methods, um, some other media filtration techniques. Um, you know, maybe the compost is going to be adding too much uh, nutrients, well, so there are some concerns about that. So we're we'll going to be also testing this with a, a couple other types of media that are being recommended by the Pro Department of Ecology. But also looking at, at installation of rain gardens, um, supporting street sweeping, that sort of thing to you know, pick up what we're, we do know is ends up on the road surfaces and encouraging the municipalities and uh, to u implement scientifically supported practices. Um, but I think that's about covers it. Hey, I hit 40 minutes. So I'd be more than happy to take any questions.